As you're seated, take your Bible and let's go to 2 Timothy. We're going to pick up in verse 8. Mind you, this is the, the second of the two letters to Timothy that we have. As Paul is writing this from a prison cell in Rome. It is certainly Paul's last letter of the New Testament, but probably Paul's last letter of his life. It is, in some sense, the last will and testament, Paul's last word. He's writing to Timothy, who's there in Ephesus, to give him instructions. We saw through 1 Timothy, uh, many of the instructions were at an institutional level. They were about how the church is to be structured and ordered. And 2 Timothy is, is almost entirely at an individual level that Paul writes to Timothy, how he is to structure and order his own life and his own behavior and his own doctrine. That in many ways, the, the banner over both is to guard the deposit that has been entrusted to you. And he's going to instruct Timothy on how to do that. We, we looked last week, the way that Paul lays out, even in these first seven verses, that we are to be gospel people, the gospel at the center. And he, he ends that section reminding Timothy that he has the very spirit of God in him, a, a spirit that is not one of fear, not one that shrinks back when things are tough, but one that is filled with love and, and power and, and self-control or or discipline, and it's in light of that spirit, and in light of that reminder that he has given him of the spirit of God that is in him, Paul instructs him, with a therefore beginning in verse 8, to say, because this is true, because you have the spirit of God in you, because the gospel is at the center of all that you are, therefore, what are you to do? Look with me, beginning in verse 8, to the end of the chapter. Paul writes, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been made manifest through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel which I was appointed, a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me, and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains, but when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. How will we face suffering? What will we do when we face suffering for the sake of the gospel? It's a question we must ask ourselves. What will we do? How will we endure? About the time of the writing of this letter, maybe a year and a half to two years after the writing of this letter, Paul is writing to Timothy in Ephesus, about 50 miles away in Smyrna, what is modern day Izmir, Turkey, a young boy was born named Polycarp. He came to faith very early on. Tradition tells us that he was discipled by the apostle John himself, that, that he learned the gospel from John, that he read the scriptures, presumably read letters like 2 Timothy. He, he read these that were passed around uh, as, even as the Spirit was working to put them into the scriptures. He, he studied the gospel. He was faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. For 86 years, he lived this life. Most of them uh, lived as a believer. And toward the end of his life, uh, in, in the Roman Empire, there, there was a turn and Christians under the reign of Marcus Aurelius began to suffer more persecution, and at 86 years of age, Polycarp found out that he was to be arrested, that the authorities were searching for him and intended to arrest him and put him to death. His friends begged him to flee, to run, to go into hiding, 
But instead, he waited at his house. And when the guards came, when the soldiers came to arrest him, he invited them in. And he fed them. And he prayed for them. And they arrested him and led him to the proconsul who took him to the arena and there implored him to renounce his faith in Christ, to to offer the sacrifices to the emperor, to, to say that Jesus is not God. And when called to renounce Christ, Polycarp said, for 86 years, I have been his servant, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul says, if you don't, we will release the wild beast into the arena, and you will be devoured. And he said, call them, which enraged the proconsul. He said, if you make light of the beasts, I'll have you destroyed by fire. To which Polycarp said, the fire you threaten burns for a time and is soon extinguished. There is a fire you know nothing about, the fire of the judgment to come and of eternal punishment, the fire reserved for the ungodly. But come, why do you hesitate? Do what you are to do. Incredible faithfulness, incredible steadiness and boldness in the face of incredible threat. At risk of his own life, Polycarp holds up and suffers for the Lord Jesus. We hear stories like that from church history, and we think, is that what God expects of all of us? You read of a man who faces wild beasts, who faces burning at the stake, and we realize that we often are ashamed of the Lord Jesus in the break room because someone finds out, finds out we go to church. Is this what God, this sort of steadiness, is this what God expects of all of us? How will we endure when suffering for the sake of the gospel comes? This is what Paul is speaking about in this very passage. That Paul is instructing Timothy that he would know how to endure when suffering comes. That Timothy would instruct the church at Ephesus that they might know how to endure when suffering comes. And by the Holy Spirit, Paul is writing to Timothy, and Paul is writing to Ephesus, and Paul is writing to us, and every believer that has lived in every age, so that we would know how to endure when suffering comes. How do we know if that is what God expects all of us? It is what Paul tells us in this very text. What does God expect for us? It is to endure in suffering. That's why Paul instructs us, as he does, that we would be ready to live faithfully until the end, regardless of what comes. We need to hear these instructions, both for now, but we need to hear these instructions for the coming ages. We need to, like all that Paul tells us, we need to pass these on to the coming generations, that if the Lord tarries, they too will know that for the sake of the gospel, suffering will often come, and they must learn how to endure. How can we remain faithful and endure in this life, even in the midst of suffering? The main command that Paul gives here in the text comes after that, therefore. In light of the fact, Paul says, that you have the Spirit of God in you, this Spirit that is not a spirit of fear, the one that shrinks back, but one of power and of love, of self-control. Because you have that Spirit in you, Paul says, therefore, in light of that, do, do not be ashamed. This is the banner over the text. The main imperative in the text is this, don't be ashamed. He's saying to Timothy, don't shrink back. To be ashamed is to, to feel unworthy, to feel foolish, to feel looked down upon, to feel inferior. He says to Timothy, don't be ashamed. Don't shrink back. Don't pull back. Of what? First, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed, he says in verse 8, of the testimony about our Lord. That is one of the many ways that, that Paul describes the gospel, of the testimony of our Lord. Timothy, don't be ashamed of the, the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the deposit that has been entrusted to you. Don't shrink back from the gospel, nor, he says, of me, his prisoner. Paul says, don't be ashamed of the gospel, and don't be ashamed of God's people. Paul is suffering for the sake of the gospel, and he recognizes the temptation that Timothy is going, going to face to recoil from that suffering. To want to pull back first from the gospel. He, he recognizes that when suffering comes for the sake of the gospel, there will be a temptation to be ashamed of the gospel itself. To pull back from the teachings of the scriptures, the testimony of our Lord, and, and to think if, if we just lay the gospel aside, then we won't suffer. He, he knows Timothy is going to face this temptation. He says, Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel that you have been given. 
Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me. That there would be a temptation for Timothy to be ashamed of Paul himself. Paul, who is languishing away in a Roman prison, awaiting capital punishment. He is going to be executed by the state. Many would view Paul as a radical. He's taken this gospel thing too far. There's no reason for him to be executed by Rome. He should give it up by now. Just make the sacrifice to the emperor and go on and keep your head. He would be tempted to view Paul and to find in Paul a shameful thing, to recoil even from Paul, to Like Paul names others who have seen Paul's suffering and have run from him, have been ashamed of him, have have pulled back. The cross, especially in this first couple centuries of the church, the cross was viewed as a shameful thing. It was a means of capital punishment. For Christians to worship a Savior that died on a Roman cross was not just foolishness, it was offensive. It was shameful. In fact, one of the the earliest graphic depictions that we have of of a crucifixion comes from the the second century. It is a graffiti that is drawn on the wall of of quarters that housed probably servants. And there is a a graffiti that shows a man dying on a cross, and the man has the head of a donkey. And the graffiti has there a man prostrate, lying, worshiping the man with a donkey head, dying on the cross. And the inscription of the graffiti says, Alexamenos worships He's God. Mocking the foolishness of anybody that would worship a Savior who died on a cross. Interestingly enough, they found in the next room a different inscription and different handwriting that says, Alexa Menos was faithful. The gospel, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, was foolishness and shameful to the people in the first century. Paul knows that Timothy is going to face the temptation in light of the shame that would be heaped upon him to pull back, to be ashamed, to shrink back from the gospel or from the people of God. And Paul says to Timothy, do not be ashamed. A lot has changed since the first century, but that has not changed. That here and now in our own day, we too will face the same temptation that Timothy faces. The people of our day find the gospel to be as foolish, as shameful, as offensive as it's ever been. They find it not just foolish, but they they find it outlandish that we would worship a carpenter from from Jerusalem who died on a cross and claimed to be raised again. That, That is utter foolishness in our modern world. We will be tempted to pull back from the gospel, to be ashamed of what we have been handed, and we will be tempted to be ashamed of the people of God to face suffering, suffering, persecution, slander that will come sometimes from your job, sometimes from your family, from your friends, to face the mocking, the shame that would be heaped upon us. Paul says there will be a temptation just like Timothy to shrink back, to be ashamed of the gospel which we have been given. At times we will convince ourselves that it is easier to distance ourselves from Christ and his gospel. To say, well, yes, I, yes, I might be a Christian, but, but I'm not one of those. And I, I'm not a lose your head to Rome sort of Christian. I'm not, I'm not the crazy radical one. I'm the regular kind that you can accept to, to, to distance ourselves from the gospel. Paul says the same thing to us that he says to Timothy. Do not be ashamed of the gospel or of God's people. Why? Paul says, because you have the very spirit of God in you. He has given you not a spirit of fear, not one that shrinks back, but he has by the spirit given you power and love and self-control. You have the very spirit of God that if you are in Christ, Paul says you have nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, the gospel, the very thing that you might be tempted to be ashamed of, Paul is going to say is the only hope for all the world. It is the only true thing there is. It is all that we have. Paul says to Timothy, do not be ashamed. I know you might be tempted to shrink back. Do not be ashamed. But what's he supposed to do? Don't be ashamed. What positive thing? What what is he supposed to do? He says, don't be ashamed, but instead share in suffering. I find it interesting that Paul does not first say, don't be ashamed, Timothy, but be ready to fight everybody at the drop of a hat. No, he says, 
Don't be ashamed. Don't shrink back. But share in suffering. What's he to do? Paul is saying to him, what are you to do, Timothy, when you suffer like I suffer? Share in it. Come on in. The water is fine. You, you come share in the suffering which I am experiencing, that just as I have not been ashamed of the gospel and have not been ashamed of God's people, and thus I am suffering for it, he says, Timothy, when that suffering comes to you, share in it. Take it. Receive it. Embrace the suffering that comes to you. We are to share in the suffering, what, for the gospel. Notice what Paul says here. You probably missed it. He says there in verse 8, Don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. How does Paul view his own suffering? His suffering is for the sake of the gospel. Paul says, they may think that I'm a prisoner of Rome. They may think that I'm a prisoner of the empire. They may think that I'm a prisoner of the state. But Paul says, my imprisonment does not belong to them. I am his prisoner. I belong to the Lord. He says later, this gospel that he lays out, he says, this is the very gospel by which, for which I suffer. I suffer for this gospel. Paul makes clear that his suffering is for the sake of the gospel. Paul here is not talking about the sort of suffering that comes to us because we live in a broken world or the sort of suffering that comes to us because of our sin. The scriptures speak about how to endure in that type of suffering. Paul here speaks specifically of suffering that comes to us because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, what are you to do? Share in suffering for the sake of the gospel. There must be in us a willingness to endure shame and ridicule and slander and mocking for the sake of the gospel. This is, I think, incredibly pertinent to us. You must be ready and you must be prepared to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Many of you have found yourself in the last few years, in situations in which you are already suffering for the sake of the gospel. I think, it's just my opinion, I I think it might get worse before it gets better. And you need to be prepared to know that for the sake of the gospel, you might lose your job. You might lose family and friends. People might cut you out of their life and refuse to have any relationship with you because of your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Students, middle, high school, you need to be prepared that in the coming years, you are going to lose out on scholarship opportunities and academic opportunities. You are going to be placed often on the outside of the group because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to know that it's coming, and you need to be prepared for it. Paul says, suffer for the sake of the gospel. Share in suffering that comes to us. We ought not be surprised by the sort of suffering that comes to us for the sake of the gospel. Jesus told us that this would happen. He said, if you want to follow me, you've got to take up your cross. Suffering was always baked into what it meant to follow Jesus. That in in fact, this is just how the world works, that everything we love, everything we are committed to takes sacrifice, takes suffering. It is baked in. You, You know this if you're married. Marriage is an embrace of suffering. Right? Put that on your save the date. <laughs> Marriage is a commitment to say, I, I am committed. I have laid myself down in a covenant out of love and commitment. I am sacrificing and putting myself second. I am laying my wants and my needs and my desires to the side that I might give myself to another person, that I might embrace suffering for the sake of the one I love. Husbands, that's why you get up early. That's why you'll get up early tomorrow morning and go to work, often in a job you hate, to work long days to provide for your family because you have embraced suffering for the sake of the one you love. Parenting is the same thing. Moms, you know the reason you eat cold chicken nuggets off your kid's plate is not because that's your desired culinary experience. Why do you do it? Because you have embraced suffering for the sake of those you love. Everything we love comes with suffering and comes with sacrifice. The gospel is no different. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to suffer just like I did. This is baked into what it means to be a disciple, that that we are going to have to embrace suffering for the sake of the gospel. It is par for the course of what Jesus has called us to. Paul says, suffer for the sake of the gospel. Share in this suffering for the gospel. How? How do we do that? He says what? By the power of God. He's not saying, figure out how to endure this all on your own. No, he says, suffer 
for the sake of the gospel, by the power of God, the means by which we will endure suffering is God himself. That he doesn't leave us alone to figure out how to navigate these things. That this is not mind over matter. This is not a mind trick that we, we convince ourselves that suffering doesn't matter and their pain is an illusion. No, there is real pain and there is real suffering. And how do we endure? It is God himself. God himself will empower us. I mean, to, to notice what Paul does. Paul, sitting in a prison, says to Timothy, don't be ashamed, but suffer for the gospel. How will you suffer for the gospel, Timothy? He says, you will suffer by the power of of God. And then it is as if when Paul speaks of the power of God to enable suffering, it's just that Paul's mind immediately goes to who this God is. And so he, he steps out of the flow of argument for a moment there in verse 9 to say, you suffer by the power of God. And who is this God that will empower you? Who is this God that will save you? Who is this God that will help you to endure in suffering? He said, it is this God who saves you and holds you. Who is this God? He is the one who has saved us. We suffer for the gospel by the power of God who saved us. He's rescued us. He's redeemed us. We were lost, but in this God, now we are found. He has saved us. Paul says more than that. He has called us. It would be enough if he just saved us, but he's called us to a holy calling. He's he's given us assignment. He's called us to live out holiness. He has saved us. He has called us. And Paul says, even better, he does all of this by grace. He saved us. He's called us not because of our own works. Not because we earned it from him, but he's saved us and he's called us because of his own purpose and grace. It is according to grace by which we have been saved. He saved us, he has called us, and he has done this by grace. Thus there is no boasting on our part. It is not about us that we didn't do this together with God. He has done it for us. He has saved us, he has called us by grace in Christ. How do we experience this grace? He has saved us not according to our own works, but by his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Paul says, when was the grace of Christ ours? He says, before the ages began. It was always God's plan to pour out grace upon his people. This is our grace. We have been saved by grace that has been poured out before the ages began. But now, he says, has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He has shown us grace and the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know the grace of God comes and sustains and saves and calls the people of God? It is by the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. This grace that was there before the ages began has been manifested now in Christ Jesus, in his life and his death and his resurrection. This Christ Jesus who has done what? Who, through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who did what? Abolished death and brought life. I can't get over the fact that Paul is riding from prison, waiting to die. And Paul says, this Jesus has brought me grace, and he has conquered death and brought life. I can't imagine how frustrating that would be for the guards of the Roman Empire. Where Paul can say, what's the worst you can do to me? You're going to kill me? Good luck. I follow Jesus. He's conquered death. Everything he has is mine. He has conquered death. He has brought life to me. What is the worst that can happen to me? Christ has already conquered that. He says we are saved. He has saved us. He's called us. He's done this by grace in Christ forever. He has brought death, abolished death, brought life, and immortality to light to the gospel. Life, Paul says, and life forever. That if Jesus Christ has been crucified, was dead and buried, and has been raised from the grave, if Jesus Christ lives, then so does everyone who is in Christ. We have, Paul says, immortality. You can take my head from me, but you cannot take my life. He has conquered death. He has brought life and immortality. He has saved us, called us by grace in Christ forever. Paul says, this is why I suffer. If you're wondering, Timothy, why I don't pull back from the gospel, this gospel that tells me that I've been saved and called by grace in Christ forever, this is the gospel that I have been called to. This is the gospel of which I am a preacher and a teacher and apostle, and this is why I suffer as I do for this gospel, for this reminder of who this God is. He is lifting Timothy's eyes up that he might see the God who has saved him to say, you can endure suffering by the power of God. If the Lord Jesus Christ 
is raised from the grave. Nothing else matters. What can this world do to us if in Christ he has abolished death and brought life and immortality? It's helpful for me to remember this even as a pastor. So there are times that I'm tempted to shrink back from what is true and right and just and righteous. And it's helpful for me to remind myself, what's the worst you can do to me? Fire me? If it goes really bad, maybe kill me. I hope not. What's the worst that can happen to me in this life? Christ has already conquered it. In him, I have life and immortality, life forever. Whatever comes to us in the coming days, in the coming weeks, in the coming years for the sake of the gospel, Paul says you can suffer. Embrace the suffering that comes from the gospel by the very power of God in you. It is God himself who will enable you, who will lift you up, who will empower you to endure. We suffer for this gospel. Share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Paul says, with confidence. He says, this is the gospel which I preach and teach and I'm a steward of. It's why I suffer as I do, because this gospel is so glorious. This truth is so life-changing, I'm willing to suffer and give everything for this truth. But I want you to see that Paul suffers, but he suffers with confidence. I'm not ashamed, he says. I want you to know, just as I've told you not to be ashamed, this is the gospel for which I suffer, but I am not ashamed. Why? For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day, that is the end of all things, what has been entrusted to me. Paul says, why can I suffer and not be ashamed? Because I know the Lord. The gospel that I just outlined for you, I know that God. I know him and I trust him and I am convinced, I am convicted that that God is able to guard both me and whatever he has entrusted me with, that is the gospel, that he will see me through until the end. That Paul suffers, but he suffers with incredible confidence and unshakable hope. I wonder if as Paul is in prison, if he thinks of the Old Testament story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember the story that the King Nebuchadnezzar had called them to bow down before his image, to, to offer sacrifices to an idol, and they politely declined, no, sir, we can't do that. And he threatens them, like Polycarp, I'm going to throw you into the furnace. And do you remember what they say to him in Daniel's book? They, they say, oh, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you on this matter. If this be so, our God, whom, I, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Oh, God is able to save us, even from your furnace. They go on, though, in verse 18 to say, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They say, oh, we, we won't bow down to you. Our God will save us from the furnace. And if he lets us burn up, we still won't worship your idols. We still trust our God. That is the sort of confidence that we endure suffering with. That's what Paul means when he says, I I can suffer whatever comes because I know whom I have believed and I am confident that he is able to guard that which has been entrusted to me. I am confident that he will see me through until the end. Paul is not encouraging Timothy, nor is he encouraging us to gamble with our lives. He's not saying, risk it for Jesus and see what happens. No, no. God and the gospel are the only sure thing you've got. Paul says, this is a sure bet. I I can suffer for the sake of the gospel because I know the Lord and I am convinced and confident that he is able to secure me and to guard me and to keep me until that day. I don't know what the Lord will bring into your life. I don't know which ways or what degree you might suffer for the sake of the gospel. I, I don't know what that will mean in your job. I don't know what that will mean in your family and your life of your children and the life of your friends and the relationships that you have. I don't know the ways in which you may suffer for the sake of the gospel, but I do know this. Whatever you face, endure it with confidence. Not that suffering is not bad. Not that suffering does not hurt. Endure it with confidence in this, that God is able to guard that which he has given you. The guard is able, God is able to keep you. That how will you make it to that day, to the day in which Jesus comes? How will you make it to the end? Because God is able to guard you. And God is able to keep you. Whatever you lose, whatever you suffer in this life, it will be repaid a thousandfold in the next. 
that we in Christ never come out on the losing side. Paul says, I can suffer, share in suffering for the sake of the gospel, by the power of God, and with the confidence that comes from being planted in that God, confident that he is able to guard us until the end. He says, don't be ashamed, but instead share in suffering and then do what? Keep the standard. Share in suffering, Timothy. What I'm enduring, I want you to share in it. You come and suffer the same way that I have suffered. For the gospel, by the power of God, with great confidence in him. And while you suffer, Timothy, what are you to do? You to, to keep the standard. He says there, verse 13, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me. Literally, he says, keep, hold the standard, the, the pattern that has been given to you. I think he has in mind here the gospel. The healthy words, the sound words. We saw the same language back in, in 1 Timothy. He says, I want you to suffer for the sake of the gospel, all the while making sure that you hold fast to the gospel. You keep the standard as, as it has been given. Keep the standard, he says, that you heard from me. We keep the standard, we follow the pattern as given to us. What is it that we hold we hold the faith once for all delivered to the saints. He, he says it a different way in verse 14. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. That Paul has in mind here this faithful pattern, this, this deposit is the gospel. It is the doctrines that have been handed down to us. It is the, the teachings of the scriptures. He knows there will be a temptation when suffering for the gospel to find a way to leave the gospel lest we suffer more. That when suffering comes to us for the sake of what we believe, there will be great temptation to change what we believe so that we will not suffer. Paul says, no, no, keep the standard. Follow the pattern as it has been given to you. You are a steward, Timothy. You have been entrusted with this deposit. You didn't earn it. You didn't make it up. You didn't create it. You are not to change it. You are entrusted to guard it, to keep it, to follow it as it has been given to you. We must keep this both individually, but we must think about how this applies to us even as a church. We see this already, that there are lots of churches that have shifted what they believe about the gospel, what they believe about the word of God, what they believe about who God is and who we are, in order to be better received by the world. They don't like people to think that they're foolish. They don't like to seem backwards. They don't like to be called bigoted. They, they don't like to be seen as fools and shameful. And so they have tweaked and shifted and jettisoned and cut out pieces of the gospel that they would be better received by the world, that they might not suffer for the sake of the gospel. Paul says, know that it's coming and know it is our job to preach and to teach the word as it is given. We are not innovators. We're stewards. If the Lord were to tarry for a hundred more years or a thousand more years and he saw fit to keep a body of Christ here at Buck Run, our prayer must be that in a hundred years or in a thousand years that we're doing the same things. That we're preaching the same gospel. That we are holding fast the pattern as it has been given to us. Keep the standard, Paul says, as it's given. We are not worried about being on the wrong side of history if we belong to the God of history. Keep it as given, he says, in faith and love. Keep the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. We're to do this in faith. He's not speaking of sort of white-knuckled rule-keeping. Or we're just sort of going through the motions. He says, no, do all of this. Hold fast to the gospel, but in faith, trusting God. But not just knowing it and holding to it, but believing it. Trusting the Lord. We do this in the faith that is in Christ Jesus and in love. What drives us to suffer for the gospel? What drives us to hold fast to the gospel as it has been given to us? Paul says, it is love that drives us. Listen, there is a place for righteous anger. The Bible speaks of righteous anger. There is a, a place for moral indignation and wickedness. Right? All, that, that is certainly in the scriptures. I worry that the prevailing emotion of the church in the next decade is not going to be love, but it's going to be anger. Paul says, we hold fast and we suffer driven by love. We love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength, and we love our, our neighbor as ourselves. There is 
righteous anger. There is righteous indignation at wickedness. Paul says we hold fast to the pattern as given to us in faith and in love. That's hard. How do you do that? How do you hold fast and suffer and yet still love God and love people? How do you hold fast and suffer and still keep the faith? Paul says we do this as given in faith and love and we keep the standard, he says, by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Paul reminds them we're in this together. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. That's how you will guard the deposit that has been entrusted to you. It is a tremendous truth. That if you are in Christ Jesus, if you have been united to him by repentance and faith, you have the Spirit of Christ in you. This is the very thing Jesus promised his disciples. When I leave you, I will not leave you alone as orphans, but I will send to you a helper who will lead you into all truth. He has promised to protect us and to guide us and to enable us and empower us by his spirit. Paul says we are to do all of this by the spirit of Christ that dwells within us. He has promised to keep us. How will we endure suffering and hold to the gospel? It will be only by the work of the spirit in us. If we are still faithful here in a thousand years or in a hundred years or in one week, It will only be due to the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We are wholly dependent on Him. How will we guard the deposit entrusted to us? By the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. We can do this only because He can do this. We can be faithful only because He is faithful. We are empowered to endure only because He enables us to do it. We are wholly dependent on the Spirit in all things. Paul says, keep the standard as it's given to you in faith and in love even if you're all alone. You have the Spirit to enable you and yet Paul recognizes that in this life that often it will feel like we are the only ones left. Verse 15 through 18, Paul gives two two examples. One of those who have fled from Paul, who were ashamed and left the gospel, and one who stayed faithful. He says, you're aware that all who are in Asia, which references that whole area of of Turkey, they all turned away from me. Especially, he names two people, Phygelus and Hermogenes. They they turned from him. They, They saw Paul's suffering, and they were ashamed of the gospel, and ashamed of Paul, and they abandoned him. They left. The the implication here, Paul is saying, is they should have been there. When I was arrested and when I was imprisoned, they should have been there. They should have supported me. They should have cared for me. They should have been with me. Paul says, everyone has abandoned me. They have all left me. In this life, as we seek to follow Jesus, some, maybe many, throughout the years, will begin to suffer for the sake of the gospel and in shame will walk away you will find that as you suffer for the sake of the gospel, that in the seasons and the moments that are the darkest, you will find that there are some people that should be there beside you. And they are nowhere to be found. They have walked away from the gospel, and they have walked away from God's people. Paul says, all in Asia have left me. They have abandoned me. They have walked away in shame And then he says, but not everyone. There is one man, he he says in verse 15, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. We've got a lot of babies coming at Buck Run in the next few months. I'd like to have a few Onesiphoruses running around in the spring. I think this is a beautiful biblical name. (laughs) Everyone else left me. He says, "But, but him. He refreshed me. He was not ashamed of me. He says when he got to Rome, rather than finding a way to get away from me like everyone else did, when he got to Rome, he was going around saying, hey, do you know where the prison is? My guy Paul is in there. I need to get to him. He searched diligently, earnestly until he found me. He says in verse 18, may the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. The fact that he says in verse 16, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus has led some to question whether or not Onesiphorus maybe at this point has already been martyred for his faith. 
That Paul is asking blessing upon the household, his household, his family. And that on the day of judgment that he might find mercy from God. We don't know for sure, but what is clear is that there was nothing that would dissuade him from coming to Paul's aid. He says, you know him. You know how well he served at Ephesus. He refreshed me. He sought me. He did not shrink back from me, but instead he came. When everyone else walked away, Onesephorus walked towards Paul. When they ran from shame and from suffering, he ran towards Paul and embraced it. Listen, many, many will leave and many will shrink back. There will be times, students in your classrooms, in your jobs, in your family, there will be times in which it seems that everyone else has abandoned the gospel, that you are all alone. It will seem like you are left by yourself. Be reminded God has his people everywhere. That we're to hold fast and to endure, even if it seems like we are all alone. Don't be ashamed of the gospel, but press on, endure, hold fast, even if it feels like you're all alone. Paul says, you have the spirit of God in you, a spirit that is not a fear to cause us to shrink back, but one of power and of love and of self-control. Do not be ashamed of the gospel, but share in suffering. For the gospel, by the power of God, with great confidence. Guard the gospel as it has been given to you in faith and love by the Holy Spirit. Even if everyone else leaves, you stay faithful. We must not be ashamed of the God who has saved us. But we must be willing to share in suffering. To hold fast to the gospel regardless of what comes. Like Paul did. And like Timothy, and like Polycarp, who said, I have served him 86 years, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul became so angry with Polycarp that he marched him out to the center of the arena and declared, Polycarp has confessed to being a Christian. And the crowd cried, burn him. And so as he stood by, they built a fire. And they placed Polycarp on the pyre and they began to tie him and he stopped them and said, no, the same Lord that has brought me here will keep me here. And so they removed the ropes and one contemporary historian writes of that time, the rest that followed, and the rest followed in less time than it takes to describe Crowds gathered logs, the pyre was ready, and Polycarp prayed, O Father of thy beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, I bless thee for counting me worthy of this day and hour, that in the number of martyrs I may partake of Christ's cup to the resurrection of eternal life of both soul and body. And when he had offered up his final amen and had completed his prayer, the men in charge lit the fire and a great, great flame shot up. Faithful until the end. How will we endure suffering? What is it that God expects of us? That we would share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God in us. The Lord kept his promise to Paul and the Lord kept his promise to Timothy. And the Lord kept his promise to Polycarp. And we can be assured that that same God will keep his promise to us. When suffering comes, our faith is in God. We know whom we have believed. And we are convinced that he is able to guard that which he has entrusted to us. We are not ashamed of him. For he is our only 